Um, today I'm talking about finding community. This week I was listening to a podcast with a New York best-selling author. Her name's Brene Brown. She's written some incredible books. Um, she has a bachelor's degree, a master's, and a PhD in social work. And in her podcast, she said after writing her dissertation, studying for her dissertation, over six figures in student loans and debt, there's one thing she got from all of her education, and that is human beings were created for connection. Not only con created for connection, but we must have connection or we will die. She said, um, she's a researcher, that's actually what she does now, and she said in all of her interviews that she's done with people, and she asked them to describe connection, to describe community, people use words like love, joy, but that's as far as they can go. So then they go on and they start talking more about community and connection and the next thing and where they really start going into it is talking about hurt and betrayal and that's where the end of the interview goes and i thought there is a war a spiritual war on our deepest need as humans and that is the need for community and connection see god created us with this incredible need this incredible desire and do you not believe that if it is something that is so important for the maintenance of our lives that the enemy is going to do everything he can to destroy it and so I believe that there is a mandate that we just have a real conversation. You know, this week, um, I have a, we, my husband and I have a son. He just turned 10. And we're kind of at that parenting stage where we sit down at the kitchen table and we have some real conversations about life. Like, it hit me. I have eight years left for him in this house. And the next eight years, I've got to instill some really important values and morals because these things will take him into the rest of his life and so this week we were sitting down and just him and I and we were having one of those conversations where I was telling him Daniel if you don't get this buddy this will impact the rest of your life and so I want to come before you today and tell you I want to have a real passionate conversation with you over the kitchen table and tell you if we don't get this right if you don't get this right it will affect your life now here's the good news news you will make it to heaven and Jesus will love you and you will love Jesus but I know that my Bible says that God's come to give me life and to give it to me more abundantly and I don't want to just survive the next how many ever years I have on this earth but don't you want everything that God has for you don't you want to experience the richness of this life and are you tired of the enemy stealing from you what you know God has for you and so I I've had the privilege of being a pastor's wife. I've had the privilege of being born into a pastor's home. In fact, I am the granddaughter to a pastor. For 36 years, I have observed many, many people, and I am passionate about this topic, and I want to clarify from the very beginning that my passion comes from a point of wanting to see you succeed. My passion comes from wanting to see you win. My passion comes from wanting to see all of God's very best come before you and for you. And you know what? The more conversations I have, the more tired I am of seeing the enemy deceive God's precious children. The more tired I am of seeing the enemy disillusion God's people. And that's kind of where this message was downloaded was I came to the point if I have one more conversation that goes this way, I've had enough because I want to see the church move forward and move forward successfully. And so I have prayed all week long, God, I want you to drench this message in grace. I want you to take this message and fill it with love because I want people to know what God has for them. And so I hope you hear my heart through this message, but I hope that you hear this as a message over my kitchen table telling you friends get this it is worth it so anyway I want to start my message off with some basically some killers or destroy destroyers that will cause you to feel lost without purpose no role lonely isolated 
and like you just don't fit in. See, a couple of conversations, in fact, not a couple, a lot of conversations I have with people. And if this is you, once again, hear my heart. This is for us to receive the victory together as a team. We're going to go into that next level of what God has for us. But a lot of conversations will start off like this. And I'm so glad I have these conversations. And, and don't stop having these conversations with me after speaking. But they'll go like this. I just feel like I'm not fitting in. Or I don't feel like I have a place here. And so a lot of times my response will be, so are you attending regularly? Are you, are you coming to services as, as regularly as you can? Then I'll say, are, are you a part of a connect group? Have you got plugged into a connect group? Then I'll ask, do you serve on a team? Have you found a team to serve on? And then a lot of times, this is a lot of responses I get. Well, I can't. I work crazy hours. I work a seasonal job, so it's the busy season, whether it's summer or winter. My kids are on travel sports teams, so we make it when we can. Or I signed up for a connect group, but I just don't click with the people or with the topic. And then I'll say, like, well, how many times did you go to the connect group? Well, I only got to go to a few evenings because, you know, evenings are just tough for me. And so usually my counsel will go something like this. It comes down to priorities. Community requires commitment. It requires an intentionality that this is what I want for my life and not just what I want for my life, but what God wants for my life. See, time, and it must be something that you value so much that it becomes a priority that you're willing to sacrifice for. You know, I've always heard this my whole life, but your calendar and checkbook are the lie detector test of what your real priorities are. We say a lot with our mouths. You know, I'm, I've been there before. Oh, my priorities are my husband, my marriage, God's before that, my marriage, then my kids, and then the ministry, and then my job. But let me tell you something. If you were to pull out my calendar at different seasons of my life, and if you were to pull out my checkbook at different seasons of my life, it would look a lot different than that. It's so easy to say things with our mouth, but those are the two things that really tell what is it you really believe. You know, um, in Exodus 20, verse 8, this is when the Lord gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And it says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it you shall not do any work. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. See, I think we've gotten away from a culture and a tradition that believes in the Sabbath. But can I tell you something? On that really short list of the Ten Commandments, one is to keep the Sabbath. But did you know that the other nine are things like adultery? It's like stealing and jealousy and envy and murder. In other words, God takes this very serious. That busyness is not an excuse for community and connection into the body of Christ. In fact, he says that we are to keep the Sabbath. And I know it is so hard. And that's why, especially in our culture, in where we live, it is difficult. But we have got to remember what our priority is. And we have to remember that this is a spiritual war. It is a battle. And everything is going to battle to keep you from having a Sabbath. But the Lord says he blesses the Sabbath. You know, we talk here in church about tithes and that God can do more with your 90 than you can do with your 100. And I believe God could do more with your six days and with my six days than he could if I took all seven days for myself. So, you know, there have been some moments in my life where logic would tell me, now is the time for you to back off. Like, let me share a specific example. So my husband and I, five years ago, moved to New Jersey. We're in Phoenix, and we know we're getting ready to make a transition. 
And during this transition, we are flying to different parts of the country. We're looking at different churches. We're saying, God, where do you want us? We know we're getting ready to pack a house and move, but we have no idea when. Doesn't sound like a good idea, right, at that time to really get plugged into church even more. Or when I talk about church, I'm talking about the community. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Um, and so for speci this specific season, I really got plugged into a women's group. And um, it was kind of one of those groups where it was a big room like this, and there was a lot of women that came to it, but we had round tables. And so everyone at the table was a group. And every time you came, you went to that table, and that was like our connection group. And I remember specifically, there were so many nights where I would be packing boxes and getting rid of stuff. If you've ever moved, you know what I'm talking about. It is like life all consuming. And even in the midst of this, we're saying goodbye to people and having goodbye dinners and having parties and, you know, really just move, packing our lives across the country. And I just felt I was supposed to stay even more committed to the body. And do you know that during that season of moving, I actually met two women for the first time. It was a larger church, probably much like this. Like if you were to look around, I bet you don't know everyone here. So the same thing is I met two women that I never met. And those two women, for whatever reason, we just clicked. Like it was just like God brought our hearts together. And I can tell you that if it was not for those women, I don't think I would have been able to pack my house and move here in, san in a sane mind. Like they would come over early in the morning with Starbucks and they'd come over with boxes. Oh, we went to the grocery store. We picked up extra boxes for you. And then they would come and they'd pack boxes. And then they would say, um, we have someone that's coming to bring dinner for you tonight. So you could just pack right through dinner. And then they would come and say, now we're going to pack and then this is what this lady would say girl you don't need this you have way too much of this so we're tossing this out there and I'm like oh but I really like that nope you don't need this and then she would just take it you know what I'm saying that kind of community and so I think that the enemy that tells you now's not the time to press in you're too busy but you know what that is the time you should be pressing in even more. And you know, when the Bible says that when you give, it comes back to you pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And I don't think that's only referring to our finances. I think that's return, referring to our time, our talents, and our treasure. So number one is busyness. Number two is not committed. I'm talking about what destroys community. What causes you to feel isolated? You know, you might say, um, there's two sides to this, that you're going to help, because I've been there, I've led so many teams and so many churches in so many ways, and you know, you're counting on someone to show up, and then that person just doesn't show up, and they don't even say, like, why? Like, oh, by the way, I slept through my alarm. Dude, that is totally cool, as long as you let me know that, but if you don't let me know that because, hey, I'm guilty, I've done that before, you, do you care about me? And if you don't really care about me, like how many times do we kind of have to go through this? You know, it's like, and so that starts tearing down community. And then the flip side of it is the people that say, I don't really want to commit because, well, what if I can only come to one out of the four? Or what if I can only come? Again, it's priorities and it's being committed. It's putting those values there. So one is busyness, two is not committed. Number three, not attending weekend services regularly. You know, this is my analogy. After being in church for so long, I want to tell you, it's like not showing up for family dinner regularly. So I'm just going to make a confession. Um, one of my favorite TV shows ever is Blue Bloods. And I hope that all of you have a concept. I Probably not because I know it's not like up there. But anyway, let me tell you a little concept. The, it's about a family of police officers. They're all in law enforcement. But what makes this show and why most people that watch this show love this show is that the last scene of every single show ends with the entire family sitting together having like a typical big Sunday night dinner. 
And you know, back, I don't know, maybe your family still does that, but I love having those in my home. Even with my four kids where it's crazy and there's food flying everywhere and we're wiping up stuff off the table, there's just nothing quite as fun as sitting down together at the family t dinner table. That's where community happens. That's where we talk about our day. And you know, if we don't attend weekend services regularly, it's like not showing up for family dinner regularly. And so Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. See, we should be coming into the house of God, too, because there's going to be some weeks we need to be spurred on. But there's going to be other weeks that someone's sitting right next to you or someone that you're going to bump into, they may, not, they may need to be spurred on. It says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Did you know it's really easy to get in the habit of going to church and it's really easy to get in the habit of not going to church? And the Lord knows that and he's just warning us here. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What is the day when he is coming back? And friend, it calls us the bride of Christ. Are you prepared? Are you preparing yourself for that day when he comes back? I don't want to be the bride that's caught off guard, that my priorities are not right, or my commitment is not in the right place, and I'm too busy getting preparations and ready to be his bride. So one is busyness, two is not committed, three, not attending weekend services. Remember, these are things that can kill community, kill um, connect connection. Number four is you believe that community and friendship happens rapidly, quickly, and overnight. So I've moved. Um, I grew up in Long Island my whole life. I went to college in Oklahoma. Um, lived a year in uh, Nashville. Lived a little bit in Phoenix, and now here. And I looked at my husband. We're right now moving some things around in our house. We had four kids, and our arrangements that we thought in our head are not working. So everyone's getting moved in our house. And um, I looked at my husband. I was, like, having a freak-out moment today. And I said, look at me in my eyes. And he said, yes. And I said, if I ever get a crazy idea, like that there's a house that I would like better than the house we have right now, we are never moving, like ever. Like I don't ever want to move anything again. In fact, I was like, my kids are going to have to empty this house out when I am dead and gone because we are not moving and I am not going through this ever again. But what I want to tell you about moving, especially moving states, is that when you move states, you have to develop a whole new community again. And so in my mind, every single time I've made one of those moves, I forgot how long it takes to develop true community and true relationships. So I'm speaking from experience on this, that it's something we need so much, we think it should happen overnight. And we have to remind ourselves, it takes a long time. You know, I was reading this and I thought, this is so good. In Acts 2... It talks about the early Christian church, and it says they devoted themselves. Think about that word, devoted. That means that they were very committed. It was a value. It was high priority to them. Even in the midst of their busyness, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And Pastor Brennan talked about fellowship. It's hanging out. It's enjoying community with each other. To the breaking of bread, dinner, having breakfast together, lunch, dinner, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day. I highlighted that. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. And this is the thing that really stood out to me, enjoying the favor of all the people. That's what community is, isn't it? It's enjoying the favor of God's people together. 
So one, busyness. Two, not committed. Three, not attending weekend services. Four is that belief that community happens overnight. It takes time. We've got to be devoted. It takes going every day. Not every day. In fact, Fusion, we don't even have services every day. But, you know, it takes getting yourself involved in the community. Number five, um, do they have a picture up here? Um, my point is you've been uprooted from another church. So this week I wanted to share something that happened. It's a picture of the plants. By any chance, do you have those? That picture. Okay, here we go. So this is in my kitchen. Um, so my kids went to a, um, they planted these, these seeds, and I, there's some kind of like peas, I think. I don't know what they are. Snap peas. Thank you. My daughter on the front row. So um, they planted these snap peas, and they got so excited because snap peas grow fast. That's why they're great seeds for kids. So they grow really fast, and um, my beautiful daughter sitting on the front row got so excited about her seed that she took over her, she brought me over her seat, and she's like, look at the seed. Okay, Caitlin, you just took it out of the cup, out of the dirt, out of the soil. Like, not good. So she was like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, hurry up and put it back in. Like, hurry up and just put it back in the, in the, in the cup. So for the last few days, hers is on the right. Daniel's is on the left. Daniel's has continued to grow higher. But Caitlin's went into shock. Okay, it almost died. But apparently these seeds are made for children, and they can be rough-handled. Not only do they grow fast, but they come back to life with a lot of care. So a lot of watering, a lot of soil, a lot of praying over it, and as you can see, it is coming back to life. But I thought about this is that, you know, many of you, and myself included, we've uprooted from a church. And many times when we uproot from a church, especially if it's not just, say, a job move across state, we uprooted from that church because we got hurt. Something happened. Something that hurt really, really deep. Maybe we got offended. Someone said something, and it just was not handled right. So typically church, I always say it's similar to a marriage. You give it all you've got, especially that first church experience. But after that deep wound, you think, I'm just not going to jump in like I did the last time. I'm just going to guard my heart this time because I don't know if I can go through that pain again. I don't know if I can allow myself to be out there, to be that vulnerable again. So this time... I was taken advantage of so bad. I was mistreated so bad. So this time, I think I'm just going to sit here. Maybe I'll dip my toe in, but I think I need to guard my heart from getting hurt. You know, if you don't get connected immediately, I've seen this so many times, you go into shock and you die because we were created for community. We were created for connection. And don't you know that the enemy knows that? And he is going to do everything to not only take that betrayal or that offense or that hurt, but he's going to try to make it even much more worse. It's like forgiveness. The greatest person who gets off the hook in forgiveness is yourself, because you have lifted that burden up, but so many times we hold on to the hurt thinking we're um, punishing the other party when in fact we're the ones that swallowed the poison and we're letting it kill us and die and we're dying. And so I was thinking in 1 Corinthians 13, it's the message version, it's so, I love this line, it says, so no matter what I say, no matter what I believe or what I do, I am bankrupt without love. And let me tell you, it is worth 
risking it again. God will heal your heart. God will go in and he will give you the grace to go that next step and to love again. But it is worth it. It is worth it to give to the body of Christ. It is worth it because, friend, it is not about humans. It is about Jesus. It is about his incredible body. So one is busyness, two, not committed, three, not attending weekend services regularly, four, the belief that community just happens overnight, being uprooted from another church and and being guarded. And number six is maybe you're just insecure. Maybe you believe the lies of the enemy that you're not enough. If they knew what I've done, they would never ask me to do this. In fact, they wouldn't even let me through the doors of that church or you think, I don't have any talents to offer, that I've not been a Christian for long, and now they want me serving? I mean, I don't even know certain books of the Bible. Or you're not just, I mean, I'm trying to be a good Christian, but, man, by Friday night and Saturday night, it's just not looking good. So I don't think I'm at the place I should be serving yet. You know, 1 Corinthians 12 is a, just an incredible verse about the body of Christ. And it says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the hand to the feet, I have no need of you. And verse 22 is my favorite. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. If you feel like you might be the weakest link of this church, that probably means you are indispensable. That probably means that God's looking down on you saying, friend, don't be insecure. Daughter, son, don't be insecure. Rise up. You might think that your part is so small and so insignificant, but if you only knew you were indispensable, If you only knew that the burden someone else might be carrying because you are not stepping up to the plate, it would change the way you think. If you only knew that maybe your part might be the key to someone else's breakthrough or even better, their salvation, you would see it so much different. Remember, I am telling you today that there is a war on community. There is a war on connection. We have to get this. This is a kitchen table conversation saying this is for your own good. This is so that you can have the life that God has planned for you. Let the enemy, t- let the enemy has put blinders over your eyes and maybe disillusioned you that today you will see it more clearly. And last but not least is the opposite of insecurity. You think you're overqualified. I got to tell you, I've thought the same thing. You pull out the connection card that's right in front of you. You look over it. You see things like this. Greeting, ushering, connect center, cafe, parking lot, kids' church, media. And you think, there is just really nothing here that meets my giftings. Matthew 10 And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. See, there's many times we just don't see what's happening in the spiritual realm. We are too focused on what's happening in the physical that we don't realize that the Lord is looking down upon us and he's saying, you just blessed one of my little children. You know, someone told me, they said, Danielle, every single time you give your children a bath, you think of that you're washing your, their feet. You're there to serve those children. And I thought, 
Lord, maybe that is why you have placed me right in the middle of motherhood in the midst of it is to teach me what it means to be a servant, what it means to wash and change diapers. And sometimes that just might be where we're at in ministry is that God might say, I just need some servanthood because there is a calling and a gifting upon your life and you need to get this. You need to get what servanthood looks like so that that next season doesn't kill you, that that power does not take you to places that are not healthy. And you know, in Matthew 23, it says the greatest among you, just like I said, that God might have some great plans for you. The greatest among you will be your servant. It says for those who exalt themselves, the Lord's going to humble them. And those who humble themselves will be exhausted, will be exalted. So what kills community? Busyness, not being committed, not attending weekend services regularly, the belief that community happens overnight uprooted from another church and just in shock, insecure about serving, maybe feeling overqualified. So I want to end today by telling you, how do you find your place? What do you do to develop community around you? Well, number one, I would say attend the weekend services regularly. Come to the weekly family dinner, and while you're at it, Bring something, because it's potluck style around here. Mama doesn't make the whole meal and cook all day, right? And so you're asking, well, what can I bring? I'm glad you asked, because I'd love to answer that. You know, I was thinking in Matthew 6, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think we should always come in prepared with our tithe, because the Bible says, that we're returning back to God what is already his. And I know that if the Lord is not the Lord of my finances, he's not really Lord at all because that is truly where my trust is. In Malachi 3, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me, but you say, How have I robbed you? God, how have I done this? In tithes and offering, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me. You know, there's no blessing in community when you're living under a curse. So as I was thinking about this message, I started thinking, I, sometimes my mind just goes into an imaginative place. So I wanted to share my, a little story about me, because I've had to learn this the hard way. That Danielle can do it her way or she can do it God's way. So I was thinking, you know, Brent and I have had a couple of, like, some serious conversations before. But where we've sat down, we realized we need a new car. We need a new house. Back when it was just me and I was 16 years old, I need to go to college and mom and dad didn't save any money. And I really don't want to graduate with student loans. So we figure out, or I figure out, and then I explain to Brendan how much money we need for a new car. Because I'm like hyper-controlling of the finances because of my background. But I've, we've learned through Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University, sign up, we've learned how to have an incredible dialogue with this. So we realize we need to make more money, so we come up with a plan. This is hypothetical, okay? So, Brendan, why don't you take a second job, I'll take a second job, and we save all that money from the second job for our car. So let's play that out. The fruit of that would be I'm exhausted because now I'm not working one job. I'm working two jobs and trying to take care of the house and trying to take care of children. He's exhausted. We're missing out on the most precious moments of our children's lives. We miss out on church because we're working all the time. We're missing out on community. We can't make connect groups. We can't have people over for dinner. We can't go anywhere. We feel isolated. Our marriage starts suffering. We're not eating well. We're feeling out of shape. Then we start feeling down. We get maybe depressed, emotional, but we scrape together enough money to get the car that we can barely afford. That's the best plan Brendan and I can come up with. It's probably the best plan you could come up with. Think about it. If you need something that big, that's probably the only answer, right? Or we can do it God's way. 
So the Holy Spirit, this has, now this has really happened recently. And I'm going to tell you all the good stories because you don't want to hear my bad stories, okay? So these are the good stories. These are the times when I've learned, when I've actually listened to the Holy Spirit. We've been saving for a car. We've been saving for a house. 16 years old, I was saving for college. All three times, the Holy Spirit. I said, Danielle, college savings, give it. The house savings, give it. All of it. The car, give it. So we do. We plant the seed in the soil. We're not lazy. We don't quit our jobs. We're not sitting around not doing anything. We're working, both of us. We're spending time, though, investing in our children. We're investing in our church community. We're investing in our marriage. And at the rare, just the right moment, when the Lord looks down on his children and he says, good job. You obeyed me. You're doing what I've told you. And meanwhile, you got to enjoy community. You got to enjoy connection. You got to spend time with your children. You got to spend time with your marriage. Your marriage isn't going to take years of healing because you had to work so many jobs doing it your way. I have a house for you. It's yours. Just take it. I have a car for you. It's yours. Just take it. And maybe you've never heard the story. I have a full college degree for you. Just take it. See, the Bible says, as a father longs to give good gifts to his children, so the Lord longs to give good gifts to us. See, his plan, he doesn't go and say, I want you to spend all this time in church and all this time in community, and then I'm not going to bless you. No, he wants you to have an abundant life. This abundant life where you get to enjoy community. You get to enjoy a great marriage. You get to enjoy your children, your friendships that are around you. And he also knows your needs. He says he knows that the birds, what they need. And so he is going to provide for you. So don't let the enemy take away the tithing from the community. Remember I said it's potluck style around here. So number three is we serve. There's three main areas to serve around here. Three incredible areas. It's our children's ministry. Children includes everything from a newborn baby all the way up to teenagers. There's our worship and our media team. And then there's our guest experience. All three of those are so vitally important. And there's so many things in each of those categories that you can do. All you have to do is fill out a Connect card right in front of you. Throw it in the kiosk. Go to the Connect Center and say, sign me up. Fourth is join or lead a Connect group. I couldn't have planned a better week to tell this message because as you leave today we are having the community group fair so you can go right outside and you'll be able to see all the connect groups and you can sign up for one and number five I thought about this is you can disciple you can mentor someone Matthew 28 these are words in your Bible that would be in red because they are the words of Jesus he says all authority is given to me given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit teaching them to observe all that i have commanded to you and lo i am with you always even to the end of the age see the very words of jesus as he's telling you to go make disciples let me tell you another quick story as my time is way over here and i'm done but this we this uh, summer we uh, did a trip to Myrtle Beach and that's where we spent four weeks as a family and I used that time I had help to write out all my thank you cards for my baby shower that you guys just blessed me with and and I made it a point to write a note in every single one and one day Brendan comes out from drinking his coffee and I'm sitting at the bar there and I'm just writing and there's tears in my eyes and he goes why why are you crying while you're writing these notes and I said I hosted a connect group, a women's connect group. Remember Yolanda over the spring? And I said, Brendan, I didn't remember. I guess I just didn't know. I fell in love with these ladies. And I said, I'm writing them their notes right now. And I miss them. 
I said, I'm praying for each of them. And I miss this group. See, don't miss out on what God has for you. That was a surprise. It was a revelation that God gave me. These are women in your life. These are lifelong relationships. It may not look how you thought it was going to come across, but those women are going to be with me until any, any moment. And, and you know, there's been times, even recently, that 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, my phone's rang. And you know, if I don't know you, I'm probably not going to take that call. But if one of those ladies' numbers comes up, you better believe I'll take that call. In fact, I will put my flip-flops on and put a baseball cap and I will go and meet you because I am in love with those ladies. Those ladies are my friends. Those are my sisters in Christ. Those are women I will go to battle for, friends. Number six, you know this, you need to be soaping every day. The word of God will give us fresh revelation into community and connection. Would you please stand on your feet? Last but not least, you need to have fun and step out of your comfort zone. Invite people over for dinner. Invite people out for ice cream. Enjoy this time. This is a gift that God has given to you for abundant life. It is time to declare war that we are going to be a church that is known for connection. We are going to be a church that's known for community. And you are going to see the abundant life that God has for you. In Jesus' name, amen.